we're stewards. We're just taking care of the land for the next generation or the generation after that. If you treat it that way and think about it that way, it isn't that we own the land. Actually, for farmers, the land owns you because it determines your days and the seasons determine your work. We are in a field of rye. My name is Kenneth Nelson. Actually, I'm Kenneth Nelson II. My father was Kenneth Nelson as well. I'm Sharon K. Loftus, but in 1967, I married Kenneth Nelson Jr. and became a part of Nelson Farms. I'm Michael Nelson. I'm the fifth generation Nelson to farm the Nelson homesteaded land. It's quite a milestone to say that you know we've been on the same same land or same farm for 150 years. It's still Nelson Farms. I mean, it has been from day one. It's still Nelson's that are running it. The family history of the Nelsons from when they homesteaded in 1864, but officially got the papers in 1866. To homestead, you had to build a cabin and you had to live in that cabin for at least six months of the year to say that you had an, an established residence on that acreage. There was no one else at this site where the Sand Creek stream intersects with the Red Cedar River. It was John and his wife, Karen. Then it went to his son, Melvin, and his wife, Ina. And then it went to their son, Kenneth, and his wife Vera, and then it went to myself and my wife Sharon Loftus, and now we've sold it to our son Michael and his wife Kelly, and they already have two sons and a daughter. The next generations are upon us. So it's kind of interesting that we have the original log cabin that John would have constructed. It's similar in construction of other early cabins in the neighborhood of Norwegian heritage for all of the neighbors. In the 1970s, and that cabin was moved north to Myron Park and is still located there today. We've just talked straight genealogy from one owner to the next. And all of this, there's a lot more people involved because there's brothers and sisters all the way the, along the line. What you call family. And that's important, what they've contributed to make this whole thing work. I always say we when we're talking about it because I consider it a family farm. Dad, mom, the sisters, several cousins actually will jump in and help. I always reference it as we, as we are busy or we have lots to do. The history of the farm is, is growing wheat. Dairy didn't come into the picture until the 1890s. We didn't become a confirmed dairy farm until 1915, because by then we had built a, a dairy barn dedicated to dairy cows, and that was a round barn, which was something unique at that time. The idea of machinery taking place of horses really took hold in the late 30s in this area. First tractor came on and it would have been a B. John Deere. And it has a single large headlight mounted on the hood. And I can remember other neighbors saying, they always knew when Kenneth was out there because he worked all night because he had that bright light stuck on the hood. And he was a glutton for punishment of doing all he could. My mother insisted that I go to college. Father really was not in favor of it. He figured I should stay home and work just like he did. I met Sharon during my college years and she was going for a teaching degree. I was going for a teaching degree as well. I practiced taught in Rice Lake. It just convinced me that I wouldn't make a very good teacher. I didn't have the patience for it. And I made the decision I was going to farm with my dad then. I'd like to say a farmer's wife is in the supportive role, but I never felt that I was just only a supporter. I always felt that we were helpmeets and that we were evenly yoked. And by yoked, I mean we were both pulling 
our half of the job. When I bought the farm from my father in 1979, it was still a dairy farm, and he had enlarged it. It was a very modern operation at that time. We were milking 135 cows at the most. We figured that we'd have to keep on increasing the herd, but somewhere along the line, I got tired of milking cows. We got out of the dairy business somewhere around 85, in the middle 80s. So then it became a cash grain and steer operation. We had about 500 head of cattle, Holstein steers. Acreage was probably a thousand acres of crops. When our son joined us, the acres started growing. And all uh, heck broke loose and it hasn't stopped since. When I left for college, I didn't, at that time, I wasn't planning on coming back to farm. So I went through college and went out and worked out in industry for a while and realized, you know what, I missed the farm. I missed plant crops, harvesting, I missed that stuff. I missed the, the aspect of, 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 everything, of farm life, basically, and made a conscious decision after a few years that that's, that was my plan, that was my goal, to get back to farm. This week, the papers were signed to put this family farm to go from me, the fourth generation on this ground, to Michael, the fifth generation on this, this family farm. And I feel pretty good about it. And here we come to the farmer who's working so hard. He is very weary of this. He's getting a lot done, but it's wearing him out. Dad and I's working relationship. Dad has made it overly easy. He's been like, well, it's all yours. At least every other day, Dad and I, we have our little sessions in the morning, have coffee, and kind of get a general idea of which direction we're going. Dad keeps saying he wants to step back more, and I keep giving him more projects. So it hasn't been a difficult transition. It's just that at times I get frustrated with him because just like any son would get frustrated with his father when he's not doing it the way I want it done. But at the same time, you can't fire your dad, so. It's best to not have my opinions too much in the forefront. I might think it, but I don't have to say it more than once. It's best to let the next generation try to learn as they go. He made her home, close to 3,000 acres this year. There is no average day on the farm. As anyone who knows me will tell you, there are no average days. Is it some bolts? Yeah. I usually have a plan of what I'd like to get done for the day. That will change several times depending on what's working, not working, what the weather does, what other family events come up, who might happen to stop, who doesn't stop, if things show up when they're supposed to. So there are no average days. Weather encompasses everything, and from the good to the crap. Spring, busy, busy, would be the definition for spring. You get the itch, you want to get out and start building. As a farmer, you want to get those first seeds in the ground and watch it. I mean, it's amazing to see that you can do all that and nature still figures it out that, you know what, I'm going to grow. This time of year, we're in summer, midsummer right now. I wake up with the sun, market reports, see what the day is going to bring, watch the early morning weather, and then if we're irrigating, which pivots are running, which ones aren't. Uh, we're doing a little bit of hand right now too, so try to figure out how that's going to work in the schedule. There's always grain that need to be moved. It's just a matter of if we're doing it or not. There's always something that needs to be done. It might not be pressing, but there's always something that should be done. Fall is my favorite season of the year, just to see harvest start and if everything you've done, you know, all the bounty that comes in. Uh, it's the crisp, crisp mornings, the cool days. I mean, the season's truly changing with the leaves. They get you the brilliant colors and you're out there harvesting. It's truly, truly fun. When winter comes around, it would be called rest and planning is what it boils down to. Basically after Thanksgiving, you just kind of take a deep breath and look back at the year. You hope everything's harvested up and put away. By the end of December, you've 
you have to go through and start ordering seed the following year, so you got to have an idea of already what is going where and how many acres. It, it's a lot of planning in the wintertime, but at the same time you try to do get away and just take a few weekenders or get a break. The point of agriculture that's changed the most is before it was subsistence, feeding the family off the land and there was never any extra. We're not a subsistence, we're feeding actually other families right now. We do a lot of corn and the hay that we raise, that goes to dairies, make milk. The rye, that gets cleaned and shipped overseas. We're re raising food grade soybeans, the same thing. They bag them up and they ship them to the Asian market. And then our green beans, everybody knows what a green bean is. That's the crop mix that we focus on. And that's the significance between 150 years ago and now. Now, of course, you know, this is the first year, I think, since 1866 that there hasn't been any cattle on the farm. I mean, it's still tough to get used to not. You go out there and there's no cattle. But signs of the times, like you say, it, it changes. I tried to make this an attractive place financially and physically to make a, a, a life with, a career out of, and let the chips fall where they may. I do remember telling myself more than once, in spite of all the work and all of the responsibilities, there was no place in the world that I would rather be than right where I was. This is what I was meant to do. I mean, I truly enjoy it. I've hit my groove. I, I mean, every day I wake up excited about, you know, the, the challenges of the day, basically. Next generations are upon us. You always have the hope that your kids will, you know, stay on and, and work the land too, but at the same time, we're not forcing them. It's up to them. When you start looking at all of the generations that have been here and think about the generations that may be here in the future, you realize again that you really and truly are just a steward.